St. John Bosco received a supernatural vision that he called the Wheel of Fortune while he was trying to gather funds to build a new wing for his creaky old oratory building in Turin. This dream is little known even by those who have studied this great saint, which is fascinating because it showed how the Salesians would have a far-reaching effect worldwide. I'll also tell a couple of stories about how he tried to coax those who worked on the new wing to go to confession. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Due to increasing discomforts and demand for space, Don Bosco had decided to construct the addition to the double facility, which now extends from the middle gate to the church of St. Francis de Sales. Don Bosco sent for Signora Giovanale del Ponte, an engineer and general contractor, and asked him if he had enough money to start work. No, the contractor replied. Well, nor do I, said Don Bosco. Then how shall we do this, the contractor asked. Don Bosco replied, we begin work anyway, and the Lord will send us money in time to pay the workers. Don Bosco repeated this standard approach with the builders whenever he began one of his many projects. This new building is necessary. I have no money, but let us begin anyway and start quickly. An estimated 40,000 lire were needed for this particular project. John Villa heard Don Bosco say several times, Don Bosco is poor, but we can do everything in God. Providence will do everything. Let us not sin, and then that God who provides for the birds of the air will also provide for us. How consoling our Father is to whom we pray every morning and evening. How pleasing it is to think that we have a Father in heaven who thinks of us. Nor did he lose hope when he lacked the means to complete his projects whenever he encountered difficulties or even when good people opposed him. He hoped against hope because he was so sure of his divine mission. Even amid misfortunes, he remained tranquil. He had the promise of the Blessed Virgin, and, as if to demonstrate this, Don Rua shared the following account from his life. Don Bosco was greatly endowed with the gift of prophecy. His predictions of future events that came true were so varied and numerous that the prophetic gift seemed to be habitual in him. He often told us of his dreams relating to his oratory and his society. Among others, I recall this one from around 1856. But before I tell you about this dream, I'd just like to recommend that if you'd like to enroll in our Saturday Mass Intentions for the promoters of St. John Bosco, just click on the link I've put in the description below. Or you can wait till the end of the video and click on the logo that's going to appear on the screen. And now I relate our dream for this episode. I found myself dreaming in a square, Don Bosco said, where I saw a wheel that seemed to be the so-called Wheel of Fortune, which I understood to represent the oratory. There was a person holding the wheel's handle who called me over and said, watch. And as he spoke, he gave the wheel a spin. I heard a tiny noise that seemed close to me. The personage asked me, did you see that? Did you hear that? Yes, I said. I saw the wheel spin and heard a little noise. Do you know what a rotation of the wheel means? The person asked. No, I don't. The person explained, it's 10 years of your oratory that just passed. The person turned the wheel four more times and asked the same questions. The noise grew louder with each turn and the second turn seemed loud enough to be heard in Turin and all of Piedmont. The third seemed loud enough to be heard throughout Italy and the fourth in Europe. The noise in the fifth turn was loud enough to be heard worldwide. The person finally said to me, this will be the future of the oratory. And so Don Bosco's dream ended. Now, as the first phase of Don Bosco's work is considered, it was limited to the city of Turin alone in the first decade. In the second decade, his work extended to the various provinces of Piedmont. In the third, the fame and influence of Don Bosco's work reached various parts of Italy. In the fourth, it extended to different parts of Europe. And finally, in the fifth decade, it was known and sought worldwide. So concluded Don Rua's account. Bolstered by this confidence, 
Don Bosco was busy writing letters to benefactors as he was an expert in raising funds for Our Lady's work. We quote one here, which Don Bosco sent to Count Pio Galliano di Aliano. Dearest Count, I need to accomplish many works necessary for God's glory and the salvation of souls, and I lack the means to finish them. If, in your charity, you could ever rescue me by sending a little mortar or some bricks, you would indeed be giving a hotel to the pilgrim and the traveler. This section of the facility is intended to shelter the poorest and most abandoned souls. Filled with gratitude, I wish that copious blessings from heaven will descend upon you and your entire family with the utmost reverence. From your grateful servant, Don Giovanni Bosco. He also wrote to the Society of St. Paul and received the following reply. Very reverend sir, from our funds, this directorate has allotted 150 lire for the benefit of your Institute of Abandoned Youth, over which your excellency worthily provides as administrator. I grieve that we cannot afford to send you a greater sum. Having arranged for the amount to be paid, I hasten to notify you so you can quickly collect it from our treasury. In the meantime, I have the honor to declare myself, with distinguished consideration, your devoted servant, President, Chapel of St. Francis. In March 1856, work began. The builders demolished the old Penardi House, which had stood as a relic of the oratory's early grandeur. The new building began following the new design. During recreation hours, the boys helped topple walls and carry bricks to save time and expense. The bricklayers included the brothers Carlo and Joshua Buzzetti, early pupils of Don Bosco, who never abandoned his service. Gifted with a good intelligence and as faithful as possible, they became such accomplished builders that they earned a well-deserved reputation among Turin's first contractors. Because it was urgent to have the addition ready for the upcoming fall, the work sped up so much that by the end of July, the new facility had a roof and four stories already built. This progress gave the community hope that it would be inhabitable soon. While these works were going on, there were a couple of incidents that showed how Don Bosco never missed a chance to recommend confession. He left the oratory one day and saw a team of mules pulling a load on the road. One of the mule drivers said to him, don't be afraid, trust me, come over here. They're peaceful animals. Don Bosco answered gracefully, my mother used to say to me, little Giovanni, never trust anyone who doesn't go to confession. The mule drivers looked at him with mischievous smiles. Another time, Don Bosco was walking down the road called Regina Margarita, and without realizing it, he walked too close to a large horse attached to a wagon. The driver told him to beware of the beast because it might kick. Don Bosco replied, I have always said that one should beware of those who do not perform their Easter duty. From these two stories, you can see that he always found a way to work in how to tell someone what they needed to do to save their souls. Thank you all so much for watching. God bless you and Our Lady keep you. You want a bone? There you go. Sit still. Sit still. Ready? Get it. Almost. <laughs>